It's taken somewhat longer in this chapter than I intended, but no matter. But we find ourselves tonight, in any case, at the last two verses. The last two verses. Um, it may make more sense if I read from verse 25. It's a very, very long sentence um, that the apostle has here. It goes all the way up to probably verse 21, but we won't read from there. We'll read just now from verse 25. We looked at 25 through 27 last Wednesday. But off I am made a minister <clears throat> according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We come now to verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. But unto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily these last two verses. Well, we return for one last time to this chapter, and we find in these verses Paul continuing on from what he had said before. You notice the connection. He ends verse 27 by speaking of Christ, and begins verse 28 with Christ, Christ whom we preach. Now, I'm going to say no more by way of introduction. There are four points that I want to draw out this evening from these verses, and they are all, well, they are four thoughts, if I can put it like that. Four thoughts. First of all, what Paul is doing. Paul describes his own ministry here. He's spoken of it already. He spoke of it from time to time. We saw in our reading in 1 Thessalonians 2 that he spoke of it at length there as well. The false teachers who invaded and plagued the church in these New Testament times were constantly trying to disparage and knock Paul down. And... Uh, you know, saying this fellow doesn't know what he's doing, or this fellow is, is living off you and he's taking a financial advantage of you and so on. And there's a reference to that in, in 1 Thessalonians. Well, said Paul, what do I do? What do I do? What is my life? Well, he tells us three things that he's doing. What is Paul doing? Well, first of all, he is preaching. Verse 28, whom we preach. Preaching. Well, there are some who would say that preaching has had its day. And I'll return to that later on. But it's what the apostle did. And the apostles went out to Jew and to Gentile. Wherever they went, they went with the word of God. Having faith in the word of God, in its authority and in its power. And recognizing that it was the means that God had appointed for the conversion of sinners and for the building up of his people. We preach, he said. And we preach Christ. Whom we preach. He's preaching Christ. The Gnostics, the false teachers, they preached a sort of philosophy. It was all philosophically based and as I said last week, ideas borrowed from here, there, and everywhere. Paul didn't preach philosophy, or even theology as such. Paul preached a person. It's not what we preach, but who we preach. It's a who. It's a person. At the very center of everything that Paul says and does is a person. The person of Christ himself. He is preaching 
Christ. He is the one in whom we have, as we saw last week, the hope of glory. And we could add further, though he doesn't make the point specifically here, that it is not only Christ that he preaches, but Christ crucified. Because a Christ that is not crucified is of no redemptive benefit whatsoever to us. Now, there are many perhaps, um, I'm thinking here of liberal theological circles, who would preach Christ, they would maintain that they preach Christ. The emphasis is often on Christ as an example, and Christ as a teacher, and Christ as this, that, and the next thing, much of which is true. But there is a glaring hole in it all, because there is nothing of Christ crucified. No concept of that, and without that, you don't have the gospel. Whatever you have, you don't have the gospel. Christ crucified. Preaching the redemptive work of the, the law. He is our prophet. We speak of him when we give him that authority. He is our great high priest. He is our king. We preach Christ. Whom we preach. Who do you got, Paul? To bring to the Jews that you meet. Christ crucified. Ah, oh, it's a stumbling block to them. Never mind, he says, we preach it anyway. What are you got for the Gentiles that you meet? Christ crucified. Oh, it might be foolishness to them. Or oh, it will be to some of them. But to those that are called effectually by the Holy Spirit, it will be the very gospel and the very marrow of the gospel. Whom we preach in Colossae, in Ephesus, in Athens itself, yes, and in Rome too, Christ crucified. What is uh, the gospel, said somebody else, but one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Whom we preach. And he's making the distinction here in these words, whom we preach. Because he's making a distinction there from others. Do not assume, he's saying, that everybody preaches it. Be ready to discern true doctrine and false doctrine. So that you will see what is good and what is vile. Whom we preach, let others do as they wish. Let fashions come and go. <clears throat> what do I do? Everywhere I go, he says, preach it. Christ crucified. What is Paul doing? He's preaching. But you notice as well that Paul is also teaching. Whom we preach, verse 28, warning every man, I'll come back to that in a minute, and teaching every man. Paul knew well that the work of the ministry involved teaching, and it does. It involves teaching basic truths so that people understand the basics of the gospel. But it also involves preaching more advanced truths so that people's knowledge and understanding will grow. And without that, without teaching, a church will become shallow and it will wither. People will not know what they believe or why they believe it. And it will slowly become a glorified social organization. That is not what the church is about. And teaching is to be a part of its work. And ministry that uh, forgoes teaching is uh, doing a great disservice to those who sit under. What is Paul doing? He is preaching, he is teaching, and thirdly, he is warning. Verse 28 again. Whom we preach, warning every man. He's warning. Who is he warning? Well, we can divide it into two. He's warning unconverted sinners. He's warning them because sin has put them in great peril. Paul didn't flinch. Even before kings and rulers, before Felix, he reasoned, you remember, of 
righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. And Felix trembled as he listened to the message. He would tell them all as they listened. He would tell them freely of their lost estate. He would tell them of their utter incapacity to help themselves. And he would set before them the provision that God had made with Christ, in Christ with the warning that there was no escape if they neglected so great salvation. He warned sinners and he warned saints. He warned saints in a different way, of course. He warns them as a father might warn his children. And this is one of the reasons we read there in, in 1 Thessalonians 2, where he says precisely that. I was like a father among you, warning and guiding. I was gentle with you. And he's a, a warning father, a mother too, would give the children, warning them about this danger and that danger. Well, he says, we warn the saints. Paul considered himself as a spiritual father for many of them. Saw them as his children in the Lord, warning them. But he also warns us, a watchman warns the city. Again, that's one of the pictures we have of the gospel ministry. Watchman, what of the night? You remember the way that's developed in Ezekiel. He warns them as a watchman. He warns them as a traveler. Warns other travelers. You know, if you're out, out for a walk and there's something um, amiss on the road or on the track you're on, you warn other people. Or if there's an accident up ahead on the road, you might flash your lights uh, to people who are coming the opposite way. He warns them as a traveler of the perils that lie around. But did you notice he says every man three times in that verse? <laughs> Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man, that we may present every man three times. That is not redundant. He's saying two things really there. He's telling us about the universal nature of this warning. The same gospel wherever you go. Jew or Gentile. False teachers were trying to put all sorts of divides in there. Every man. Every man needs the same message. Every man needs to hear the same truth. Every man, every woman, every boy or girl. Wherever they are. Whoever they are. The universal nature of it. And the universal need of it. Nobody is above it. Nobody can say, well, I don't need to hear this. I, I'm too young. I'm too lacking in understanding or I'm too advanced in understanding. Whichever end of the spectrum it might be, nobody's up below it. Nobody's above it. When we preach warning every man, every man, every man. It's a recurring call to repentance, isn't it? Repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. What Paul is doing, verse, uh, verse 28, he's preaching, he's teaching, he's warning. Secondly, what Paul is wanting. You'll find this at the end of verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. The end of all this preaching and teaching and warning is that we may present every man. Now, obviously there, it's not a universal every man that ever existed. It's every man who is in Christ, perfect at last. So the aim of it all then is spiritual maturity. But they will be perfect. They will be perfect. They'll all be perfect. You know your own heart, Christian. You're probably the most imperfect Christian you've ever met. One day you will be perfect. Perfect in knowledge. Perfect in holiness. Perfect in that 
righteousness of Christ in the sense that the work of sanctification will have been completed. Perfect through God's grace. Every man, every one of them will be perfect. No flaw in any of them. And those of them that are already in glory, there's no flaw in any of them. Not one of them is perfect. They're all perfect now. That will extend to your body as well. Uh, once more, Paul uses a very deliberate word here. We've seen already in this chapter that sometimes he uses certain words and they're, they're very specifically chosen because they were words that the false teachers like to use. We saw that last week with mystery. They, they, they made a lot of mystery. So he says, well, we have a mystery as well. The word that he takes this time that he borrows from them is this word perfect perfect it's one of their favorite words the false teachers you know they they would have um they were kind of a closed society really these these groups that would invade the church um what they would do and sometimes extreme charismatic groups do it to this day they come into a church and they, they, they draw a select group and they are kind of elevated uh, in a special way and they have secret knowledge and secret understanding. That's the way they worked. And you became a disciple of theirs, of these of these false teachers. And um, it had a lot of undertones of sort of secret society really um, to it. It was very, very strange. I mean, we can't even begin to imagine it. But one of the one of the things they would have would be this perfection you would be a novice and you would be initiated into some of the secrets of the gnostic heresy and then the more you graduated up through the ranks you would eventually become fully instructed in the secrets and in the mysteries of that religion it was it was really satanic well, Paul uses the same word. Well, he said, you hear the, the false teachers banding about this idea of perfection. Be a perfection as well. Complete and mature in Christ, with every pollution cleansed and every deficiency made right. That they may be presented at the last as spiritually mature souls now in 1 corinthians no it's 2 corinthians 2 corinthians 4 verse 14 that work of presentation is ascribed to god the father in ephesians 2 27 it's ascribed to god the son to christ what Paul desires in verse 28 is what Christ himself desires in verse 22. You notice verse 22, in the body of his flesh through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's Christ's desire, and it's Christ's work by his spirit. Here, Paul ascribes it to himself that we may present every man. Whoa, sounds just a little bit arrogant, doesn't it? You're going to present every man? Is that not the work of, of God? When well, all Paul is saying was that through his ministry, through the preaching, the teaching, and the warning, God was working to the day when they would be presented perfect and complete. A power, of course, behind it all that far surpasses mere human endeavor. But Paul feels a responsibility for them. As their spiritual leader, he's looking to the day when he would present at the last before God the Father. 
which leads me to that mysterious bond between congregation and pastors. There are aspects to it which we don't think about, maybe, as we should. I was thinking about this, and um, <clears throat> my mind was directed, it was actually through something I read, to Abraham's servant when he went to get a bride for, 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 for Isaac. Well, what a task. It was, it was an impossible task. He was told, humanly speaking, it was an impossible task. He was told there were certain things he wasn't to do. It was not to be a Canaanite and so on. So he had to go on this journey, and where do you start? And of course the Lord guides him. You remember he guides him to Rebecca at the well, and the whole thing just comes together miraculously, really, and wonderfully. And he goes to find a bride for his master's son. And, you know, there were so many obstacles in the way. The family were keen on it for a start. And they, they keep moving the date and all the rest of it. And eventually he has to get quite firm with them and so on. But the day comes. And they go through the perils of a journey. And any number of things could happen on these journeys in those days. But the day came when he was able to present her to his master. Here she is. Here she is. Well, there's something of that here as well. Here she is. All presented at the last. That day is coming. What Paul is doing, preaching, teaching, warning. What Paul is what do? The presentation of the last. Thirdly, what Paul is using. And you'll find this in verse 28 as well. Whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom. How is it to be done, this preaching, teaching, warning, in order that they may be mature believers? How is it to be done in all wisdom? Do not really refer to the way that he did it, that he did it wisely. So some of the commentators take it, and that's as far as they'll go. Now it's true that Paul did use wisdom. He used discretion, God-given wisdom. You know, he, he gave milk for the babes in Christ and strong meat for those that were more mature. He became, as he says himself, he became as far as he could, all things to all men. That by all means he might save some. Yes, he did it wisely. But surely, surely, it's also a reference to the word of God. By what means shall a young man learn his way to purify? If he, according to my word, there to attend to me, as we sang a minute ago. All the wisdom that the others had were their own ideas. But Paul comes with the wisdom of the word of God. A wisdom that finds its ultimate locus in Christ, who is himself the wisdom. And the fount of every wisdom. In all wisdom. In all Christ. In all Christ's word. In all that he has given that's what Paul is using. That's his great influence. So for Paul's preaching, teaching, warning, it's not human knowledge or the religious theories of the false teachers. But as Carson puts it, the whole sweep of the wisdom that is from above. I like that. The whole sweep of the wisdom that is from above. What is Paul doing? What is Paul wanting? What is Paul using? Fourthly, what Paul compares himself to. As he goes about this work, verse 29, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me, 
mightily. What does he compare himself to? Well, he compares himself to a laborer, but unto I also labor. To Timothy 2 6, he speaks of the husbandman, carefully tending the crop. That's a picture of gospel ministry, watching out for weeds and the tender plant and giving water and giving food and all the rest. It's a picture of the cultivation of the soul and a picture of the cultivation of souls. Mm. So there's the laborer, but there's also the athlete striving according to his working. Now, that word striving there, it's one of these words that you would use for an athlete. It's not actually as strong in English. You know, you're striving for something. You're putting a bit of effort in, but maybe you're not, not massive. The Greek word is stronger than far stronger. It means strenuous effort. In fact, the Greek word is the one that gives us the English word agonize. Agonizing according to his mighty power. He is agonized with an agony of earnestness because he sees the magnitude of the issues at stake. Agonizing on their behalf. Breaking sweat. Straining. Pushing. Pressing. So could the Colossians sit back then and say, well, Paul's doing all the agonizing for us. Not at all. They also had to strive for that final presentation, pressing towards the mark, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's not food. It's not down to Paul or anyone else. Verse 29, but unto I also labor, striving, ah, here we go, according to his working, which worketh in me. Everything depends on his working, working in me. I work, but he must work in me. And unless he works in me, all my work is nothing. His efforts needed to be accompanied by the power of the Spirit. How else could he have any success? How else could he achieve so much? You know, people sometimes wonder how Paul achieved so much. With a thorn in the flesh as well, whatever it was. Yet he does. Paul doesn't ascribe any of that to his abilities or whatever. It's according to his mighty power which work the mighty in. Everything comes back to that. And the work of Sunday vacation comes back to that as well. It is all done by God's power and God's grace. And though he faced all the forces of hell, the gospel was blessed in Colossae and many is another place. Because God honored his own institution with blessing. Preaching is not just one option for a church. It is a divine ordinance. It is never to be replaced, never to be sidelined, never to be trivialized. It is a divine ordinance and God blesses his own ordinance. He is under no obligation to bless anything well, I began by saying preaching. Some people say the preaching stays gone. Well, you know, the power of unbelief would almost make us give up. Truth be told, it would almost make us give up. But it's unbelief. The word of God keeps us right. So Paul agonized. And so did somebody else. Somebody else agonized before Paul ever agonized. Luke 22:44, and being in an agony, 
Christ himself agonized. He agonized for his church. He strove for his church. His church is his church. Bought with his blood. Elected by his power, by his grace. Preserved by his mighty arm. Church isn't just an institution. I think I touched on this last Wednesday. It's not just like any other institution. It's the body of Christ for which he agonized. But then I've been beyond what we can ever understand. You remember. You remember that when the devil comes at you. There are people for whom Christ has agonized. You remember that when you become cared. Christ agonized for his church. You remember that when the world starts to invade your life and thoughts and ways more legitimately than it should. Oh, I don't trivialize any of this. He agonized. Then the apostle agonized. What does he say to us? Agonize to enter in. Strive. Later in the street, you see more. Matthew Henry puts it like this The more we labor in the work of the Lord, the greater measure of help we may expect from Him in it. The more we labor in the work of the Lord, the greater measure of help we may expect from Him. Well, we are dependent on it, as dependent as we can. But we are dependent on one who says, My sufficiency is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. Well, may God bless His word and our hearts this evening. And so we must say now, Psalm 1 4 7. From 147, and we're going to sing from 16 onwards. <clears throat> and it goes on to speak in verse 18 of God sending out his mighty word, the doctrines of his holy word, verse 19, to Jacob he doth show, to any nation ever he such favor did afford, for they his judgments have not known, nor do ye praise the Lord God's word. Doctrine of the word, the truth of the word, and the blessing that comes with it. From 16, old frost and gashes. Our frost life Yeah, 
We seek, O oh Lord, thy blessing upon us as we part. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion and fellowship of God the Holy Spirit, rest on and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.